So I'm listening to this voicemail and I'm like, oh my God, some guy has got my phone number. It is a man's voice, super sinister. (laughs) And he says, Rachel, you'll never guess where I'm hiding right now. My boyfriend was sitting next to me and I'm like my hand shaking. He's like, baby, what's wrong? What's wrong? Because I like just went pale. And I hand the phone to him and he listens and he like freaks out. He's just like, oh my, you know, he's like about to go murder someone. Today, we're going to talk about boundaries. We're going to talk about boundaries in the most basic ways that I can explain them. And also that I can talk you through why you need them. Why do you need emotional boundaries? And then how do you establish them? And I can already tell because I've written two full pages of notes that this is going to be a two-parter. I'm not even going to pretend that it's not. We're just going to go ahead and say that there's going to be a part one and a part two. And... I also would love to establish right at the top that I think there are some of the most incredible experts out there on this topic. They're incredible psychologists. There's incredible books on it. Uh, Dr. Nicole, I think, is one of the greatest sort of people in the space when it comes to content on boundaries. If you don't follow her on Instagram, you totally should. Her books are amazing. We're definitely going to have her on the show. Have been trying to get her on the show for a while and just our schedules haven't lined up yet. But that is coming. And in the meantime, I wanted to share with y'all my, you know, girlfriend's guide to (laughs) boundaries and like all the things. Not from a therapist perspective, but just what I have learned in the last decade of doing therapy with this topic. I feel like, at least for me, boundaries are one of those things that everybody talks about and you sort of know you should have them, but it's really hard to figure out how and when to put them in place and when to hold them up. So what I wanted to start with, if it's okay with y'all, is the basics, at least the basics according to me. And that is, what is an emotional boundary? That's what part one is going to be about. What is an emotional boundary? When does it show up? When are your personal boundaries being crossed, whether with or without your knowledge, whether with or without your consciousness involved? Like, when are people creeping into your boundaries? When are they taking advantage of boundaries? Like, all of that. And then in part two, we're going to talk about how, well, first we're going to talk about why. Why should you fight for your emotional boundaries? Why should you fight to hold them in place? And how it frees you up energetically, it lowers stress, it raises confidence. Like there's all sorts of groovy things that happen when we learn to be fully mature human beings and we learn to stand up for ourselves and own our personal space, our personal emotions, all that stuff. Uh, So we're going to talk about why you should have boundaries. And then we're also going to talk about the most important, which is how. How the hell do I figure out a boundary? How in the world do I establish that boundary with people who don't have any experience in boundaries? Because make no mistake, if your mama, if your mother-in-law, if your partner, if your friend, if they had a relationship with healthy boundaries, they wouldn't be encroaching into yours. So... How do you uphold boundaries with someone who doesn't get what they are? Like, we're going to talk about all the things. That's what we're digging into while I wear a tracksuit that I stole from my son. Uh, Because that is a perk of being a shorty. I am barely 5'2", and that means I get to wear kids' clothes. Don't be jealous. Let's jump in. What is an emotional boundary? At its most basic level at its most basic place according to me some internet research i've done some therapists that i've met with over the years a boundary is you separating your feelings from someone else's feelings let me say it again a boundary an emotional boundary is you understanding that there should be separation between your feelings and someone else's feelings at its most basic level That is what it is. Now, perhaps you're thinking, wait, why is it a bad thing? Why is it a bad thing if my emotions are in line with someone else's emotions? Shouldn't that be real if 
you know, this is my husband and we're in a committed, romantic, loving relationship with each other. Shouldn't our feelings be connected? Or maybe you're like, well, I'm a mother and I have these children and my feelings are connected to these children, right? Like, have you ever heard that expression? You're only as happy as your least happy child. It's f Your feelings being attached to someone else's feelings is codependence. There is an incredible book that has been around for a very long time called Codependent No More. And for most of my adult life, I thought that codependence was that you needed like someone else to make you happy. I was like, oh, codependence is like, I need this person to make me happy. And then when I was doing a lot of healing after a very big breakup. I read that book and my brain exploded because I didn't understand how deeply codependent I was because my codependence showed up in believing that I could make someone else happy that I could fix someone else, that I could prop someone else up, that I could help them to be strong, that I could help them to succeed, that I could just do the right equation and then they would be okay. And on some very subconscious level, I believed that if I could make them okay, that then I could finally also be happy. Like, somewhere in this tangled web of unhealthy relationship it had gotten to this place where our feelings were so intertwined that it was not possible for me to be happy if they were unhappy and if you're with someone who's unhappy all the time for whatever reason in however that shows up then it is you as a codependent partner or as an enabler who's constantly trying to just well let's do this let's try this let's give you this let's help you with this let's do this thing because then maybe we'll finally find the cure for your happiness i think this shows up a lot in parenting i think moms do this a ton where we're like oh my gosh my 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 kids unhappy they're fighting with their friends at school or their girlfriend just broke up with them or they're experiencing these things and you're like oh my gosh it's my job to fix it it's my job to make them okay no just across the board even if it's coming from a place of love that is deeply unhealthy it's okay for your kids to be unhappy sometimes. It's okay for human beings to be unhappy, for them to go through periods of sadness, anger, bitterness, betrayal. These are normal human experiences. And when we try and shield other people from those experiences, especially our kids, I think it sets them up for failure later in life because they've been guarded from things from feelings, from emotions that will most definitely show up again later in life. Only later in life, you're not going to be there to protect them from those feelings. But simultaneously, they have no tools in their toolkit to know how to handle it. So as a mama, I want to walk beside them while they go through these experiences and offer wisdom and insight but not try and control the situation or manipulate the situation so it's less painful if you got in a fight with your friends at school like if you were arguing with your friends at school and you're upset about it well let's talk through that and let's talk through how you can go to school tomorrow and interact with them and maybe ask some questions maybe apologize for the way that you showed up maybe they apologize to you like let's let Let's, uh, let's talk you through this and give some advice versus I'm going to call her mom. The mom and I are going to get on the phone and we're going to fix this problem together so that you both don't have to feel bad about what happened. Using parenting as an example is an easy one because that's something that I deal with all the time. But I'm guessing that many of you, myself included, or that many of us, experienced moments in our own childhood where there was lack of emotional boundaries, where 
our mothers, our fathers, um, older members of our family tied their feelings to our feelings or tried to force us or tried to teach us that our feelings should be attached to the way they were feeling. This happens a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, especially if you have a parent that has any narcissistic tendencies. You know, a narcissist is completely in their own ego about this world. They believe that the world is only happening to them, about them, and they only want to hear about your feelings in a situation so that they can flip those feelings and use them against you or flip those feelings and tell you that you're wrong. So it's a sort of sneaky way of getting you to sort of give them, giving, getting you to give them ammunition that they can use to gaslight or they can use to manipulate. And I just want to say, if someone is crossing emotional boundaries, they have never been taught that emotional boundaries should be in place. So I thought of the idea for this episode because I find myself in a season of life where I am interacting with people I haven't interacted with in a long time. And there are people who are back in my life who I have not interacted with in years. And those people are not people who have emotional boundaries or who understand what is normal behavior. And I find myself interacting with these people as the woman I am now, not the young woman that they once knew. So I find myself in this situation where people are using tactics to manipulate or control or process their own stuff and they're trying to do that with the version of me that they used to know and that bitch is gone she is not here she has done her therapy she has done her work she has done all the things I have done all the things and so I can recognize what's happening now and I have zero issue with telling people what my boundaries are and refusing to let them pass over those boundaries for any reason. So it occurred to me today because I had this interaction that was totally inappropriate. I found myself slipping back into a younger version of myself. I mean, if you are familiar with IFS therapy or um, inner child work or there are different parts of us that are sort of frozen in time in our psyche. And if you have ever been in relationships where people push past boundaries or you didn't even know that you were allowed to have boundaries in the first place, it can be very easy to fall back into those traps particularly if you're dealing with someone who at one time was able to get you to do what they wanted to, was able to get you to, um, they were able to manipulate your feelings. They were able to make you feel guilty. They pushed on the fact that you were a people pleaser and really they know those buttons and they know those triggers and they know exactly what to do to get you to make moves the way they want you to make moves. Um, But like I said, I've done too much work. And last night, I really was feeling all kinds of ways. And I was like doing my own therapy work and like talking myself through and figuring out all these things. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to talk to the guys, meaning you guys. I'm going to talk to the guys about this because number one, if you haven't done the work, then there's a very strong chance you don't know how to put boundaries in place. But even if you have done the work, we can still all slip back into these old ways of thinking and you have to snap yourself back out of it. So that's what today's conversation is going to be about. Now, let me break down into bite-sized pieces this concept of what a boundary is and the idea that you need to separate yourself from people's feelings. This concept of a boundary 
which I, I should, we, this should be a drinking game. Like how many times am I going to say the word boundary in a single episode? Let's drink water every time I say it. Okay, so the easiest way that I know of to talk through the concept of a boundary is to talk you through what the opposite is. Instead of saying like, this is what it is, let's talk about what the opposite is. Let's talk about what is not a healthy boundary in your life. So number one on my list taking responsibility for someone else's feelings taking responsibility for the way someone else feels someone else's feelings on any level are not your responsibility i don't care who it is my one exception to this is if you have a baby if you have a baby and that baby is crying obviously the way that it's feeling is your responsibility other than that anyone else who is asking you to take responsibility for their feelings is acting like a baby. It's your mother who is really upset with you because, you know, she's like, I'm just, I'm so sad. I'm so disappointed. We always spend Christmas Eve together. And, you know, this year you're spending Christmas Eve with the in-laws and she's super frustrated. She's super pissed and she just is telling you that she is so upset because of you. No. BS. Someone else, what, who said that? Which is like a a president's wife, a first lady. Um, No one can make you feel badly without your consent. No one can make you feel badly without your consent. Roosevelt? I don't remember. The point is, the same goes for any kind of feeling. Your mother absolutely has every right to her emotions. She is allowed to be sad. She's allowed to be disappointed. She's allowed to be any old way she wants to be about the fact that y'all aren't going to spend Christmas Eve together. 100%. But her feelings on the matter are not your responsibility. They're not your responsibility because she is choosing how to look at this situation. She has decided, she could look at this situation and be like, how amazing for Amy. How amazing for Amy. All she ever wanted was to get married and be a mom. And now here she is. It's her first Christmas with the baby. And she's going to go to her in-laws for Christmas Eve. And then she's going to come to our house on Christmas Day. And this is so special for her. This is literally her dream come true. And of course, she'd want to spend it with the in-laws because, you know, Eric needs time with his family too. And like, look at them being so organized and like dividing and conquering the holiday, even though it's hard for us them because they have a baby like your mom could look at that through a lens of positivity your mom is choosing to look at it as something bad she's choosing to look at it as something you did to her she is making this situation about herself i'm making up this story guys but you can find your version of this someone else's feelings are not they're not your responsibility You can only be responsible for your own feelings. So taking responsibility, feeling any kind of way about someone else's emotions is you not having a healthy boundary in place. The second way that people lack healthy emotional boundaries is that you let other people dictate how you feel. So I am a prime example of this in a past relationship that it was hard for me to feel how I felt without also worrying about how they felt, without also trying to fix them, make them better, make them happy. And look, this is learned behavior. This is something that I grew up experiencing with my parents. And I've talked about this a ton, but if you grow up with a parent who is volatile, who has, um, in my father's case, really severe anger issues, um, was emotionally abusive with that anger, and, you know, didn't have the tools, didn't know any better, did the very best he could. I honor both my parents with that, that they did the best they could. But we're allowed to say that you did the best you could and it still at times really sucked. And when you have a parent 
that is volatile, where you don't feel safe, where you don't have a sense of security, where you are constantly from a very young age taking the pulse of the room, checking the energy of the room and trying, is everyone happy? Is everyone okay? Should I tell a joke? Should I get an A on the spelling test? Should I do something to make everything in this space okay so that it will stay calm so that I will be okay? I learned that at a very young age. I learned my whole childhood that my role was to make sure that this man stayed emotionally stable. And then I unknowingly took that into my adult relationship. So I know why I did it, but it took me a very long time to see what I was doing. So I was, and I take full responsibility for that. That's not their fault. And that's something, if you have healthy emotional boundaries, a part of that is taking ownership of the experience. It's you understanding that you are the one who signed up for this. Someone can try and control us all they want. Someone can try and manipulate us all they want. Someone can try and do anything they want to do. But they can't do those things without you agreeing to it. And you might not have the capacity to stand up to them. You might not have the ability to say no. There is a whole host of reasons why you might not be able to hold up boundaries. All of those are fair. But you have to understand that the reason you find yourself in this situation is because you are not taking ownership of giving your power away. You are giving your power away to them for whatever reason. And in order to reclaim that power, the first thing that you have to do is acknowledge that you are the one who gave it up. Because y'all, if you don't understand that you've given your power away, then you're going to believe the opposite. And the opposite is that they took from you they took the power from you and in that scenario someone else is in control someone else is in the driver's seat you are impotent you don't have the ability to control your situation and you absolutely do you need to understand that you absolutely do it is your birthright on this planet you are born with personal power you are born with it it is in you and the moment that you realize that is the moment that you start taking that back. So the next way that people have unhealthy emotional boundaries is that you will sacrifice your needs to please others. Woo! Hello to the parents listening to this conversation. You will sacrifice your needs to please others. And what's wild, and I am guilty of this, but what is wild about this, mamas, friends, sisters, anyone in a relationship, is that most of the time, they're not even asking you for the sacrifice. You are giving it because you have preconceived that this is the thing that will make them happy. How many of you are not pursuing the dream of your heart because you have decided without consultation, you have decided that, you know, if you really tried to write your first book, if you really tried to start your own podcast, if you really tried to be a content creator, if you really tried to start that business, if you tried to do any of those things, that it would take time away from your children and then you'd be a terrible mother and then they'd be in prison and then it would all be your fault. Like you already decided all these things. You sacrifice your own needs because you believe it will please others. You know that you should practice self-care. Maybe you can even afford to go get a massage this month, but you don't get a massage. You don't do the thing that you know, because you know if you got a massage, you would miss two hours at home with your four-year-old. And the four-year-old, by the way, didn't ask you to stay home with him. He's super happy playing with dad. He's super happy hanging out with grandma. He's super happy at preschool. He's doing his thing. But you have taken on guilt, some kind of weird guilt that you decided you need to own rather 
than paying attention to your own need. That is a deeply unhealthy emotional space to be in. And that one only grows. That one only gets worse. You're like, I'll sacrifice this. I'll give up this. You know, you're really excited to go to like the Luke Bryan concert with your girlfriends. But now someone needs you to volunteer at the class bake sale and you feel guilty if you don't. So you sacrifice the thing that you wanted to do. You sacrificed your need. This is potentially one of the most insidious, hurtful things that I think is happening to mothers today. And that is this giving up of self. That somewhere along the way, we were taught that we became a totally different human as soon as we had a child. Now, don't get me wrong. You became a different version of the person that you were when you had a child. But you did not get rid of the person who loved to go to the club and shake her ass. She's still there. You did not get rid of the guy who loved motocross. He's still there. You did not get rid of the person you used to be because you had a baby. How many of us go through cycles of low-grade depression when we have a toddler? And I'm not talking about postpartum, which is horrible. I'm talking about low-grade depression when you have a toddler and you're like, what is this? What is this? I don't, who am I? What am I doing? What is the point? Like, what the f- is happening in my life. If you escape toddler years and you never had a season of like, I have no idea who I am or what I love or why I'm here or what is going on and how in the world am I supposed to take care of this baby if I don't even know these things about myself. If you never had that season, praise be, congratulations. But me and all of my friends absolutely had those seasons. And I think that that shows up because we believe that we're supposed to, you know, snap our fingers and be someone new. The old you is still there. In fact, it is the number one that I, it's the number one thing I say to people when they come up to me, you know, if I'm on tour at a conference, I'm speaking, whatever, and they'll come up to me afterwards, you know, they want to take a picture, whatever, and they'll be like, I don't know who I am. Like I had these kids and I take care of these kids and I'm doing my best. I go grocery shopping, I do the laundry, I do it, but I don't know who I am anymore. And I'm like, oh, okay, start with who were you before you were their mama? Who was she? See, on a totally different tip, I'm going to take a quick side note here. I have this theory that oftentimes when women are unsure, when they're in that messy middle, when they're in that inner space where maybe you're post-college or you're a young adult, you're working and maybe you maybe you even found your partner, or maybe you even like got a cute little place to live and you guys are setting it up, you got your little apartment, you're doing your thing and you hit that point where you thought you'd be further along by now. You thought that you'd already have your goal. You thought that you were going to be this person that you had in your head by now. You can't see me, I'm using air quotes. By now. You thought you'd have it by now. And when you hit that, you go through this existential crisis, you start to freak out. And what many women do, you will not convince me otherwise, what many women do is instead of doubling down, instead of going, okay, My dream is still alive. My goal is still there. I'm not where I wanted to be. I'm going to increase my passion. I'm going to increase my efforts. I'm going to go harder. I'm going to bring more love to this process. I'm going to bring more abundance to this process in pursuit of me becoming the woman that I know I can be. But most women don't do that. Most women hit that point and they think, oh, maybe it wasn't supposed to be mine. Maybe I wasn't supposed to have that. Maybe I wasn't supposed to do that thing. Maybe I was silly for dreaming that way. And in the not knowing, they can think of something that society believes would be great. They could have a baby. They could become a mama. 
And there's only goodness surrounding that, right? There's only positivity. There's only beauty and love and this little human that's going to be so special. And all the grass in that field is green in your imagination. And they think, you know, it's I'll go have the baby and then maybe, you know, I'll circle back around to this idea of who I am and who I believe I can be. They make that first sacrifice of a piece of themselves in pursuit of this thing. I know this story so well. I am this story. This is exactly why I can look back and understand like, oh, this is the space that I was in when I decided to get pregnant. It's so beautiful and I love this about life that I'm like, oh, it all happened exactly as it's meant to because that baby is 16 and he's one of the greatest parts of my life. I wouldn't, couldn't take that back. But something that nobody ever said to me, and I'm going to say to you right now in case you need to hear, is having a baby is not the solution when you're not sure what to do next. The only reason to have a baby is because you cannot think of anything that would be better. That you have wanted this for so long that the, you are ready, you are financially ready, you're emotionally ready, you are, you've done your therapy, you feel like, yeah, I could do a pretty good job of bringing another human into the world. That's the scenario where you actively try and get pregnant. Obviously, things happen in a million different ways. But I am only speaking specifically to whoever needed to hear that they're feeling stuck, they're feeling uncertain, they're feeling unsure. And one thing that they're circling around is, well, maybe it's time to have a baby because I'm not really sure what else to do. <sighs> Having a baby is the best. It's also the worst. It's also the hardest. It's also a complete giving of self. It, it, it takes everything you got. So I know I went on a tangent, but my instinct is someone needed to hear that today. Emotional boundaries. Sacrificing your needs to please other people. And here's what's really important about this concept. It is your needs according to you. According to you, according to nobody else. Nobody else gets a say in this. Nobody else gets to have an opinion. I will give you a perfect example. I do not like to be scared. I have PTSD from really extreme trauma when my brother died. And much of that trauma was surrounding a very, very horrific experience for me as a 14-year-old girl. And the way that the PTSD has always manifested since that time is I, I startle really easily. So I'm very scared of loud noises. If you jump out and scare me, my reaction to that will be so much more extreme than what just happened. It like, it's terrifying. Uh, so it's just a rule with my kids. They've known since they were little not to scare me. And eventually, they all got to a place where they were old enough for me to explain to them what had happened and why I was asking them to not scare me. My 10-year-old is in a stage where he thinks scaring people is hilarious. And there's been a couple times where he's like jumped out in the last couple months jumped out and scared me and I have very strongly said to him you cannot do this like this really freaks mommy out like please I am I am asking you as a personal favor please do not do this like if your brothers are fine with it do it with them but please don't do it with me and this is actually like hilarious but also petrifying so um the other night, I'm laying in bed and all of a sudden, I have a voicemail. 
And I'm like, that's weird because like who calls me in the middle of the night? And I look and it's a voicemail from New York. And I'm like, okay, I do business in New York. Like maybe someone has called my phone. I don't know. And I press play and my stomach drops to the floor and I am instantly like violently shaking, sick to my stomach, petrified. It is a man's voice, super sinister. (laughs) And he says, Rachel, you'll never guess where I'm hiding right now. And I like can't breathe. I am, I'm like literally like my hands shaking as I'm holding the phone. In this line of work, uh, you get a surprising amount of death threats. Um, I have gotten many death threats over the years, most specifically from men whose wives have listened to my work, listened to the show, read the book, done whatever, and they got healthy and they did their therapy and they left abusive marriages and then those upstanding men um, then decided that I was the reason that their wife left and so I've had all kinds of um, really scary things so I'll just FYI um, but so I'm listening to this voicemail and I'm like oh my god some guy has got my phone number and my boyfriend was sitting next to me and I'm like my hand shaking. He's like, baby, what's wrong? What's wrong? Cause I like just went pale and I hand the phone to him and he listens and he like freaks out. He's just like, Oh my, you know, he's like about to go murder someone and into the room runs my 10 year old who's laughing because apparently the new scream movie had a website where you could put someone's phone number in And then the Scream character, the bad guy, would call and leave a voicemail with their name and say something scary. Ford runs in laughing and then immediately sees both our faces and freezes like a deer and realizes that he has done something very dumb. And I I was like... I was so upset. I was crying and just because I had... I was so startled by it. And I was like, you don't have to understand why I am asking you to not do this to me. Well, first of all, he lost his phone. He has like a, he doesn't have like a phone phone where you can call, but he has like a little old phone of mine that he like plays games on and he can text. And I was like, you've lost your phone. You've lost the privilege of having this because you're using it in an inappropriate way, but also You don't have to understand why I am asking you to not do this. But if we are family and we love each other, we respect what someone else is asking for. So part of a healthy emotional boundary is you saying to someone, this is my need. This is my need. You don't have to agree with this being a need that is valid, but we both have to agree that each other as humans are valid and therefore our needs are valid. And someone can decide to be in a relationship, I'm not talking about mother-son, but in adult relationships, someone gets to decide, you know what, the needs that you have don't align with the person that I am or the values that I have, and I am not gonna be here anymore. That is a very healthy way to pursue a relationship where you say, yes, I will agree to the needs that you have for your life and I'll allow you to keep those boundaries without me trying to manipulate or control or make you feel guilty, or I won't. That's that's that. The next thing that is the opposite of a healthy emotional boundary is blaming someone else for your problems. Very unhealthy. Blaming someone else for your problems. Look, people absolutely have hurt you in your life. People have done things that you had no control over. When you were a kid, people can be evil to their core. I have seen so many examples of parents who weren't evil people, but because they didn't have healthy 
emotions. They absolutely did things to their children that were irreversible, like fucked up their kids because they had stuff. I'm sure you have experienced friends like this, or maybe this is your family who does this, but you cannot control what someone did to you. You can't. It's unfair, it sucks, it's harsh, it's wrong. But if you blame them for the problems that you are experiencing right now, today, you are allowing them, even if they're no longer in your life, you're allowing them to still energetically cross boundaries. It's like, I'm trying to think of how to properly explain this because I think it's really easy to hear that statement and feel like it's potentially victim blaming right to say you know to blame them for the problems that you have and I'm trying to be careful with my words because what they did is real that's sort of seeing life for what it actually is The distinction here is that you don't continue to give your power away by still giving them control of your current circumstances. So, I mean, I think we do this in breakups all the time. We're like, well, she hurt me, she cheated on me, and now I have trust issues. Yes, she hurt you, she cheated on you, But the trust issues you have, that's your own experience of this current situation. You can do therapy. You can do group work. You can really work on your heart to work through your trust issues. You can look at that situation and flip it and see it in a different way. Or you can keep blaming someone else for the way you are currently acting. Also, as a side note to this, If you are my friend, I would tell you to read The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday because I think it is one of the best concepts that I've ever read and was very helpful to me to be able to look at the things that someone else has done to you or that you have been forced to endure or the life path that you found yourself inside of to look at those obstacles and be able to see to mine them for the parts of them that helped you, for the parts of that that made you strong, for the parts of that that made you brave, that gave you a thicker skin. Like, I believe not everything happens for a reason, but I believe that you can find meaning in what has happened. So blaming someone else for the way you currently live because of something they did to you in the past is giving away control of your life experience. The last one that I'll say on this tip is, so blaming someone for your problems, the other thing is accepting responsibility for their problems. Accepting responsibility for their problems. This happens a lot inside of codependent relationships this happens a lot inside of if you have one member of a family or one member of a couple who is an addict who is an alcoholic who is some kind of addictive who is some kind of an who is some kind of addiction that you take responsibility for their behavior you take responsibility for the way that they are showing up in the world because you believe that you have to for a lot of ways, right? Like you believe that you have to take responsibility or maybe they'll really go off the deep end. You think that you have to take responsibility or maybe they'll hurt themselves. You think that you have to take responsibility because it's better for your kids if you sort of keep this thing together and the kids don't ever have to find out. We take responsibility for other people's behavior because we don't understand that that is not our job. So hopefully something in that list gave you some insight or maybe gave you an example of a way that this shows up in your own life. 
In part two, I'm going to talk through how to set boundaries, but I want to just really quickly talk through what setting boundaries looks like. So let's say right now today, I went through that list and you thought of an example in your own life of a situation or a relationship where you're doing one of those things. So what does it look like to set a boundary in your life? It looks like saying no without guilt, shame, anxiety, fear, or any other negative emotion that has been used to control you. The number one thing in my family was always guilt. Was always, we're going to guilt you into feeling badly for not wanting to come to the family party. Even though in my heart of hearts, I know that I'm going to get there and everyone's going to be crazy and it's going to make me feel super uncomfortable and I'm going to wish I could leave and I'm going to hate every second of it. But if I don't go, then everyone's going to make me feel guilty for not going. This is a different version of myself because did you notice she feels like someone can, quote, make her feel guilty. Having healthy boundaries means me saying, no, thank you. My gosh, I hope you guys have so much fun. We're not going to be able to make it without any negative emotion attached to that. And people can try all they want to push little digs, to say passive aggressive comments, to use manipulation, to say whatever they want, to tell a friend, you know, to tell my sister who told my cousin, who said to whoever, you know, that I'm just too good and I think too much of myself and I never show up in my hometown anymore because I forgot who I am and then someone lets me know that that's what someone's and I'm like great like well don't you care that she's saying that about you I'm like no I don't that's her journey she's allowed to say whatever she wants about I have literally like zero attachment to what someone says about me who I don't respect and I can see now what the intention is like I can see how someone's trying to use that particular situation to manipulate or control to get me to conform and then I can also because it's like family circle I can look at her mom and go oh yeah I see exactly where you got this from and then I look at her mom's mom like great aunt whatever I'm like oh yeah I see she did it to you too this is just a vicious cycle and unfortunately that cycle will continue to go but I'm just going to choose not to take part in it. So saying no, saying no. No is a full sentence. I like, no, thank you. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, saying no without guilt, fear, or anxiety. Number two, setting boundaries looks like taking full ownership of your own actions and emotions. You admit when you mess up, you admit how your emotions feel in this particular moment, you take full ownership of it. And you understand that that's you. That the way your partner's feeling today should not be affecting the way you're feeling today. Hopefully you guys can come together and hype each other up and be a source of great emotion. And maybe when someone's a little bit down, you can like be a source of, of goodness and they can be around your energy. But that you understand that you are not responsible that you are not required to feel low because they feel low. The third thing, setting boundaries looks like holding physical boundaries. Now, this is a really important one on a lot of levels. This is important when it comes to romantic relationships and how we feel about our body and what we feel like is safe and good and right and makes us feel calm and centered and then things that don't make us feel good and that we understand that those feelings will be respected regardless of whether or not our partner understands it regardless of whether or not our partner agrees with it that you are allowed to have full autonomy over your own body this is something that i've worked on really hard with my kids particularly my daughter so my first three are boys. My youngest is a six-year-old girl. And from the time she was little, I have hammered home with them 
that if they're playing, if they're hugging, if they're doing anything physical and she says no, they have to immediately stop. Immediately. Because I want her to understand that when she says no, it has power, especially when it comes to boys. So, you know, it'll be like they're playing a game and like her brother's pushing her on the swing. And maybe he started pushing her a little too high and she got scared. And she's like, no, Sawyer, stop. And I'll be like, no, be brave, whatever. And I'm like, nope. She said no. And I want immediately that we respect her wishes because I want her to understand that that is the way it should be. Because that is not how I was raised in the 80s. Not at all. Like the things that boys were allowed to do physically and frankly that girls were allowed to do to other girls. Physically like get in fights, pull each other's hair, snap your bra strap, just like do all of this shit that nobody ever said that they weren't allowed to do. Nobody ever told us that we were allowed to say no or that we were allowed to tell a teacher if a boy was doing things that made us feel uncomfortable or unsafe. And so I want her to understand that she has autonomy over her own body always, always, always. The same is true for boys, obviously, but I feel like this is a bigger issue when it comes to girls. Uh, the other physical boundary that you set is your physical space, like your home. Now I'm going to get into this in more detail in part two about how do we maintain physical space. Let's say you got some crazy family and you don't want them in your house because you can't stand their energy and you don't want them around your kids, but also you don't want to cause family problems. What does that look like? How do you hold that boundary? Uh, so we're going to get into that in part two, but understand autonomy over your body, autonomy over your space. Those are healthy emotional boundaries. So that's part one. I hope you dug this episode. I hope you like had an aha moment. You figured something out. You saw something. You're like, oh crap, I probably don't have a very healthy emotional boundary with my sister and I should work on that. Um, I hope there's something in it. And if there was, do me a favor. Send this episode to someone that you think needs to hear it. Maybe you send this episode to the person who has some boundary issues themselves and maybe they can see some patterns that they're exhibiting or maybe that they're taking part in from someone else, which is why it's trickling down to you. But, uh, you know, the thing I love about us as a community is that we share information. So if you got something out of this, please pass it along. I am Rachel. Happy to be here with you on this journey. I appreciate you listening in. And uh, until I see you next time, I love you and I'm rooting for you. Can you imagine what would happen to men if once a month they started bleeding from their penis? The world would shut down.